The Coonhound Collective Podcast is brought to you by CZ Welding and Custom Dog Boxes. Dog boxes built by hunters for hunters. Check these guys out today. This is your host, Jason Snurgrove, and I will be your guide as we journey down the road to pleasure hunt or hitting the long trail to those great cop hunts. This is the Coon Hound Collective Welcome to the Coon Hound Collective Podcast today. Today I am joined by Mr. Jared Washburn. His picture you might have seen on the Night Light magazine that comes out uh, that you can order your coon hunting supplies uh, from. Jared, how's it going today? I'm doing good, Jason. How about you? Oh man, pretty good. It's uh, deer season in Missouri. Um, I've seen a deer, but I haven't got one yet, and I'm going to go when me and you get done here, and uh, ho- hopefully get one kill before this front moves in, and um, I- I'm really anxious to get back to coon hunting, uh, more-, more so than deer hunting, as soon as we can get some of these days of deer season behind us. Deer season started this weekend in Arkansas, and the Orange Army took over. They're, they're everywhere down here, deer hunters, but uh, it's a good time of the year. It's uh, finally cool down here, so deer hunters have the weather they like, and us coon hunters like this cooler weather, too. Yeah, and, and you know, I, it, it ain't that I think coon hunting has anything to do with, with messing with deer activity or moving, but some of my landowners that allow me to hunt on them, they they don't say that I don't have, that they don't want me in there, but, you know, out of respect for them, I, you know, we, we only get 10 days in Missouri to, to gun hunt, so I try to, try to kind of take a step back during that time and... Uh, as soon, soon as it's over though, I'll be, I'll be back wide open. Absolutely. Same down here with a lot of places. Well, Jerry, why don't we start off by just tell us a little bit about yourself and where you're from. Okay. Uh, I'm 43 years old. I'm, I live here in Sheridan, Arkansas. It's about 30, about 30 minutes South of Little Rock. I wasn't born here. My dad was an aerospace engineer and we started out in California and moved to Washington state and we, uh, he got transferred here and. 1992 so i've been in arkansas since 1992 and uh, i love it down here yeah that's uh that's pretty country down there i recently took a trip to alabama and uh went down through searcy and then kind of down south of the interstate there and kind of cut across to greenwood mississippi and that's 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 definitely some some pretty country in that area where i was at there Oh, it sure is. You wasn't too far from me then going that way. Yeah. Real yeah. pretty. I, uh, I went through that way, uh, and stopped there in Greenwood to interview Mr. Eddie Muse that used to own set him up ACE, uh, back in. Oh Miami. yeah. So, um, well tell us, uh, what, what, what do you do for, what do you do for a living there? Okay. Well, me and my wife own a foreign company and, uh, we do, uh, all the uh, types of click lock flooring, um we've been in business together for about five years now and it just it's a good fit we uh we don't have any employees just me and her and you know we stay busy and we've been blessed blessed with the business yeah and you know i'm i'm we talked before you know we hit record here and i'm self-employed as well and you know there there's days where you have to get out there and get after it boy but when you got a dog you're trying to push and you can get some jobs finished up it sure is nice not to have to get up to go to a nine to five well, uh, owning your own business has its perks. Like this week, the uh, North Dina of the White River Refuge opens, and uh, I didn't schedule anything for the rest of this week, so I'm getting ready for that. And you know, I'll be off for a couple weeks for the North, uh, the South Unit, and that's the type of stuff you can't do when you work for somebody. So, uh, owning your own business has its perks when you're a coon hunter. Yeah, and I'm glad you brought that up. The the White River Refuge is on my list of to dos. I have not been there and hunted. I, I've heard Steve Fielder talk about it. I've heard some other guys talk about it, uh, about the coon hunting there and, and, and how great it is. And last year we were going to try to make it like a family trip with it and come down and camp and hunt. And it just did not work out with my work schedule last year. It was a little warmer, longer, so. Uh, we had some things going on longer and I couldn't get freed up. And then this year I kind of started a, a new branch of, of my business and bought some equipment and we, we're kind of running at, at both the ends right now. So it's not going to work out this year, but that is definitely on my to do list as far as coon hunting is, is to go there and hunt. Cause I, I've heard a lot of good things about it. 
it's a um, it's kind of like my Disneyland. It's the one I look forward to three things a year. I look forward to the Arkansas State Youth Hunt, English Days, and the Refuge. And it's it's a uh, if everything you've heard about, I could tell you that much, Jason. I've hunted Michigan, Indiana, Illinois, and I still like the big woods of the of uh, the Refuge down here. It's a uh, it will spoil you in a hurry. Yeah, I, I, I bet you mentioned English Days there. I didn't hunt. Uh, this year, but I did go to English Days uh, this year um, for for one of the days to to meet Nathan Kaufman up there and uh, pick up my doll box and uh, that that really seems like a good event. I lived in Illinois for about a year and I, I know what kind of hunting they got over there and I'm I, I'm excited. Uh, I, I have a, a pretty pretty decent young dog that I'm hunting right now. If I can get a few things worked out with him. Um, I'm excited to to be able to take him and hunt him up there uh, next year in it. It's a it's always a good time. I just like the fellowship and and the the association puts on a good hunt. And I, matter of fact, last year the Thursday night hunt, I hunted with Nathan. He was in my cast, and the year before that, I actually hunted with him uh, in 2021 with Nathan. Good guy. Yeah, I, I, hey, I can't say enough about Nathan. He he makes this podcast possible. If you're listening, you need a good dog box. Go over, check out CZ Welding and Fabrication on Facebook. Um, you can look him up there, give Nathan a call, get a hold of me. I can put you in contact with him. He, he can fix you up any kind of dog box. He's, I, I'm telling you, super, super guy. He drove all night to come to the Shriners Benefit Hunt here in Missouri to, to deliver dog boxes that he built for them to give away for the uh, high school, the night hunt winner and the bench show winner, uh, both received a dog box uh awesome awesome guy he he delivered them out here himself so i i i can't say enough about the guy just like i said if you need a dog box tell him Jay, you heard jason talking about him and he'll he'll fix you up with a good deal on a dog box and <laughs> b- before we get into how you got into coon hunting and we kind of talked about this before we hit record um you you, you mentioned uh, uh, some stuff with the english breed association and we've talked about english days and i think it'll fit right here why don't you go ahead and kind of go in go into a little detail about what the english association has got going on this year hey guys this is jason over at the coonhound collective podcast is your dog box starting to get war maybe it's starting to get a little crack like mine is maybe you've just been thinking about it's time to upgrade to a to a new box but You've asked your buddies and you're just not real sure what direction to go in. Well, let me help you out here. Go check my friends out at CZ Welding and Fabrication Custom Doll Boxes and Aluminum Products on Facebook. You can check out all their custom work they do there and their designs that they do. If you don't see something that you don't exactly like there, reach out to Nathan at 540-810-810. 540-810-5439 or send him a message through the Facebook page. I bet he can fix you up. Don't wait till fall to get that new dog box. Go ahead, get that dog box now. Get you uh, get you something looking good in the back of your truck that, that you can be proud of and that you can haul your dog around in comfort. Check my friends out at CZ Welding and Fabrication. You won't go wrong. Dog boxes built by hunters four hunters get yours today cz welding and fabrication okay well they've started this year they started this new program it's uh it's over the course of five hunts it's called the uh five star outstanding english coonhound race program and if your dog wins at the grand american the winter classic english days autumn oaks or the world championship you get points and at the end of the season whoever has the most points for uh, at those hunts, will win a thousand dollars, sponsored by the uh, United English and Breeders and Fanciers Association. Um, another thing that they do, and uh, first off, I just want to say, support your uh, your associations. They do a lot for the hunters, and uh, the way that they do that is through people joining uh, the membership and then doing parts of the raffles. The English Association every month has a raffle. They've done dog. Uh, dog garmin collars they've done lights and boots every month of course i've never won one because i have pretty bad luck but every month i'll I'll buy a spot and or two and it's just a good way to to help the association the money for that goes towards the invitational hunt winner and those price packages keep getting better and better and uh, that's because of the hard work the association members do in the and from the actual members donating their money to these uh to these raffles and these programs so just wanted to throw that out there and There'll be more information coming out about those, but uh, 
uh, I love our association. Uh, I've dealt with the people in the Black and Tan Association because Mr. Hands from down here in Arkansas, and they do a good job with the Black and Tan Association. And it's just, uh, I think it's important as hunters to support your associations, support your uh, state associations. Um, it just, without us, the hunters supporting those associations, they can't do as much for us, the hunters. So I think it's important, but that's uh, that's that's what's going on with the English Association. I'm real proud of, of the steps they've made and they're doing. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree. I, I'm, I'm a member of the English Association, and I'm a member of the Black and Tan Association. And, um, you know, I, I'm a me- member of the Missouri Coon Hunters Association here. And, I, you know, it, it it's not only important to support those uh, associations, but it's also important to support your local club, to, to, to show up at, at those hunts and, um, and, and be there at those, at those hunts to help that club stay, stay alive and, and going. Cause we all, we all know, um, uh, especially where, where we live now, I had Mr. Greg Cover on a, a few episodes ago and he has to travel quite a, quite a ways to, to go to a competition hunt. But I know for me, uh, and Jared, it may not be this way for you, but I know for me that I can pretty much go to a hunt every week at least it, it, most weeks multiple times a week if i wanted to and i think sometimes um with that many hunts we can be like well you know i, I don't need to go over here to my local club i just went to that one you know an hour down the road or whatever but your your local club you you, you know I, I can't stress this enough and i and, and i talk about talk about this before make sure you're supporting your local club that you're a member of and, and being out there and being a part of, part of that that's close by. Cause you know, I, I know a lot of people get caught up in the traveling and running races and stuff like that. And all that's important, but it's also important to be a part of that, that local club and these uh, breed associations and any others, in my opinion, any other association you can be a part of that has to do with hound hunting. You're absolutely right, Jason. We, uh, we've got a club here in my town. We do UKC and PKC hunts. We do also do club hunts. And uh, I used to have about eight clubs I could be at within an hour of my house, and now there's only two. And uh, so I like to support the ones that are closed. It takes me – I mean, on average, I'm driving an hour and a half to a, to a club normally to a hunt. But uh, we go, and there's times where I don't really want to go, but we go just to support the club. And if they're doing a special type of benefit hunt or anything like that, we'll go and support them And because uh, – um, you're absolutely right. You got to support them. And that's what we do down here. Well, and you know, we, we had a two night UKC hunt, our last one of the year. Um, uh, it was, I think the last day of September and the first day of October and our vice president, our secretary, man, my hats off to those guys. They, they beat the bush. We, we, we had a meal, uh, $5 a plate, they got the community involved. We have people show up that don't even coon hunt, uh, just just to eat. And, and man, that's a, that's a a coon club can be an important part of the community um, out there, and, and that's why it's important to get out and support these guys. It sure is. Our local club here, we uh, we did three benefit hunts, but we took the money from our the entries for our club hunts, and we uh, had three benefits. We had a fellow that got hurt an accident at work and we got him some money. We had another young fellow that had cancer and they was making a lot of trips to the to out of state doctors. So we got them several hundred dollars raised up and we had another young man that hunts in our club get in an accident and we had a benefit to hunt for him. And we had people show up and just donate money and leave. They didn't even hunt, but they came together and it's just a tight knit community of coon hunters. We really, you know, come together and look out for for people and I think it's a really awesome thing. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more, and I've, I've said that even about the Shriners hunt that, that we were uh, blessed enough to be a part of, and Nathan was able to provide some prizes, and, um, you know, it, even if you think it's not a, a lot of money to, to those people, it, it, it is. It, it means a lot to, to those, so that's a that's definitely an important part of, of our sport. Um, but, yes, sir. But before we completely get off track here, won't you uh, – Tell us kind of how you got into coon hunting. Okay. Well, uh, I didn't grow up in a hunting family, but when we moved to Arkansas, you uh, quickly become one. We, uh, I, I play music, and I was in eighth grade, and uh, I joined a band, and the drummer and the singer 
invited me to come over to go deer hunting. And uh, I said, okay. Well, I get there and come to find out their younger brother is a coon hunter. And he said, we're going coon hunting. I'm like, what in the world is that? And they told me, I was like, well, it sounds like fun. Let's go. And we went and uh, my buddy had a, she was a half red bone, half uh, lab. Looked like a plot dog. But she sure could tree some coons. And we went that night and I got wet and cold. And I think we killed five coons and I had a blast and I was hooked. It didn't take no time for me to get hooked on the tree dog. So, um. I spent, I wasn't even old enough to drive, so my buddy Preston would come get me, and uh, we'd go coon hunting, and I guess I might have been in 10th grade, 9th or 10th grade, and uh, I guarantee we hunted five nights a week until, I mean, well, I never quit, you know, but uh, we hunted that little black, and that little black dog all winter, all summer, we had just had us a blast, and I got to where I wanted my own dog, like everybody does, and you know, I didn't really know because I didn't have, you know, an older person to teach me at the time the difference between a coon dog and a hound dog. And I ended up with just a bunch of hound dogs. Uh, they were good at digging out, jumping fences, but they weren't very good at training coons or doing anything, really. I went through, shoot, probably five or six dogs before I got one that actually barked in the woods. And uh, I don't know what it barked at, but it would bark. And finally, I decided I needed to buy me an actual coon dog well my dad at the time was working with somebody at the, his uh factory and they had a litter of red tick puppies and he said i'm gonna buy you a, a puppy and you can train one yourself son so I, he got me a puppy and i named him ranger and uh, he was at a hard time rage and a local female and a big pretty red tick dog and i had high hopes and dreams of him you know but, uh, looking back on it i didn't have no business trying to train a puppy but uh he didn't be an okay dog. He'd run anything that laid a track, and I was proud of him. I, uh, you know, I wanted to take him everywhere I went coon hunting, and it, I mean, I want to own him today. <laughs> but, uh, and then, uh, my, my other buddy had a half sister to him. Uh, she is four years old. Her name was Sue, and she would tree coons. I guess you call her just a country coon dog. It might take her all night to tree one, she might get tree five, but, uh, she would tree coons uh not very good tree dog just you know for a kid she was fun i thought the world of her too and uh so i bought her i paid three hundred dollars for her and i kept her till she died i kept her for six years uh she's not no measuring stick or nothing but she was my actual first dog that i could say that you know with tree coons that i owned and uh she's the only one of three dogs that i've ever owned that i kept till they died at my place i mean i thought a lot of her uh and that's how I kind of got started, uh, just coon hunting in general. And, um, I was looking through my coon hound bloodlines and I saw an ad for the Arkansas state youth coon hunt championship. And I want to say this was 1996. And, uh, I didn't know anything about competition coon hunting, coon hunting. I, you know, I read about it in the, in the bloodlines or the cooner, but I, you know, I'd never been to one. I didn't know anybody that had been to one. So, uh, taught my buddy into driving me up there and i took sue and uh i didn't win but that hunt changed the trajectory of my coon hunting career because that's where i met clifton crosby he was a um, he's the president of the state association then and he just happened to live in sheridan where i lived and we got to talking and uh told me to come for a hunt and so i did and that first night i hunted with him we treated seven coons and walk my guts out they hunted walker dogs and you know my dog maybe she's a two or three hundred yard dog and these dogs were split train they was going all over the place and uh from that point on i realized i need to get a better dog if i wanted a competition hoon hunt but uh i think the most important thing that happened there was me and cliff became really good friends and he became a mentor my dad died when i was 16 and uh cliff kind of stepped in as a mentor role and he uh Man, he's a good guy. He'd always been there for me through my ups and downs. But he taught me how to, you know, hunt a good dog. And I don't know, the, the lessons I learned from him are invaluable. I, I I got a lot to owe to him. But uh, he took me to the Pine Bluff Clean Club where he kind of put me to work. You know, I was working in the kitchen. And at this time, I'm still 17. I might have been 18, but... Might have been, I think I was 17, and this is back when you'd have 40 dogs at a hunt. 
So, and then I would, I was hunting in the hunts, uh, but I wasn't hunting a dog that could win in the hunts. But, um, you know, he'd have me working in the kitchen, taking entries, and I just, uh, just a good friendship was formed and a, a love for competition coon hunting was formed, just being around the hunters and, and the, just, um, you know, back then, it was, uh, like I said, a night hunt was kind of a big deal, and it was awesome to be around them. Being a young guy and being around hearing the stories, and uh, you'd even have people show up that I recognize from the magazines, and, you know, I'll just be honest, sometimes I was starstruck, you know. I remember one time Warren Hauser showed up, the guy had the, the Smoky River Blue Dogs, and uh, one time uh, David Westbrook showed up. He had the Capital City Go Annie dog that won the 95 World Show. And he showed up, and you know, I, I showed against him. I got beat, but I showed against him as a young guy. That was that was pretty cool. And uh, <clears throat> so that's kind of how I got my start coon hunting and got introduced into competition coon hunting. Uh, I hunted... I bet I was in 50 or 60 casts for actually won a hunt. Uh, it was an ACHA world qualifying hunt. And uh, I can't remember if you hunted two hours or three hours back then, but we went and we hunted and hunted and hunted, and it wasn't going too good for me. And we did tree a coon, and the other dogs messed around and took some minus, and I ended up winning. I didn't even know I'd won the cast because I was so used to losing. But But when I won, I got my picture took. Back then, you had to take your picture on a Polaroid and put it on a certificate to go to the World Hunt. And uh, I remember I was just so tickled that I won. And uh, that's, that was my first actual competition win. But uh, that's how I got started, Jason. You you, uh, you said take take your picture on a Polaroid. I'm quite sure there's probably some <laughs> listeners out there that have no idea what you just said. Because <laughs> um, they, they, now you just take them with your phone. Right. Yeah, it wasn't like that. And uh, I also remember trying to take, I would see these pictures of these dogs in the magazine that were training, how cool the pictures looked. And I bet I took a thousand pictures and never got a good, good, decent dog picture because back then you'd have to take the picture, get them developed, and see what you got. Well, I never got anything good. So taking a picture of a dog training these days is a lot easier than it was back then. Oh, man. I couldn't even, I, I mean, I used to keep a disposable camera with me and I'd take some pictures of my dogs around the house or whatever. And I've tried to take, back in the day, I tried to take some at night. I had a, I had old wheat light that you put, uh, you put, you know, the, the acid in the front of it or whatever. And that, you know, that's, that's what I had and, and it wasn't bright enough for, to make a good enough picture for me so i have no idea how those guys got those pictures um they, they had to hire somebody professional or something they had to do something other than what i was doing because i never could get it done <laughs> yeah so you uh of, of course we, you know being a member of the association the english association we know you hunt english dogs but you know you you mentioned there your mentor there he was hunting walker dogs what what kept you from going over to to hunt walker dogs full time well, I I kind I kind of did. So, uh, I had Sue, which you know she was she was my my I loved her, but she wasn't a great coon dog. So and I seen with Cliff and all them guys were hunting. So I actually bought. Uh, well, I, Cliff made a cross on Sackett Junior, and every dog of that litter turned out was a grand knight and a good coon dog. Well, I didn't buy one because at the time I didn't want a Walker dog. Well, he bred. Uh, Cindy to a dog he had named Outback Jammer, and uh, I decided I was going to get a, get one, so I bought one of them pups and started hunting it. And uh, not very long after I bought it, Cliff ended up selling me uh, Jammer. He was a he was a Grand Night dog. He placed in the top twenty of the World Hunt, I believe, in ninety five. Uh, top ten of the Lee Crawford Invitational Hunt. He was a he was a nice hound. So I hunted him for a while, and uh, I still had. You know, Sue, which was an English dog. Um, I bought a night champion walker dog and hunted her for a while. Uh, had a nice young dog off a of Yosha River Razor. Uh, so I have had walker dogs. Uh, I'm not, you know, I'm not blind at that time. I just, I wanted three coons and, you know, be able to compete and with them dogs I was able to. Uh, but... My friend James Wadley, uh, he won one of the pro sport truck hunts with Ralph a few months ago. He called me one day and said, hey, uh, I know where an English dog is that you could win with. And I'm like, you know, I think I might have been 18 or 19. I was like, James, I ain't got just a whole lot of money. He goes, well, Buddy will work with you. Oh, I said, oh, Buddy has it. Buddy Gilbert, uh, 
he's kind of a legend in our sports, owned a couple world champions. He had a dog named Gilbert Screaming Speck, which was an English dog that was always up in the state race. And he had a, had a son off of him. His name was Knock Him Out Louie. So uh, I called Buddy, and we worked out a deal, and I got him. And that's the first dog that I can honestly say was my competition dog. He, Louie, did a lot of winning. He is he was pretty consistent. And um, from then on, I was pretty much just stuck on English dogs, to be honest with you. I've, you know, and I think that's because that my dad bought me the English dog puppy, and it just kind of it was a bond that me and my dad had. And you know, my dad died before he ever that dog ever you know got took to the woods. And I just I've just liked the English dog since then. But I had Louie and uh, got three or four other dogs at the time. But Louie was, was my main dog. And I guess this would have been in maybe 2001, 2000, about early 2001, 2002 time frame. And uh, so we went to doing some winning with uh, Louie, got him qualified for the, the world. And I had a, a younger fellow. His, his name was Justin Davis. He was 16 years old. Him and Louie were a good team. Justin did a lot of the winning with Louie. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> they just had a good time. And uh, you know, I was young, and this is kind of when my story, unfortunately, takes kind of a sad turn. I made some bad life decisions and kind of just kind of fell off. And, well, guys, and to be honest with you, I got hooked on mess. And uh, it didn't take very long. It it, it took a hold of me. Uh, I was trying to hunt, but you don't do much other than give into your drug addiction when you get addicted to drugs and so I ended up uh, selling, uh, sold, well, I sold all my dogs and uh, ended up getting busted cooking meth in 2004. And I went to prison for uh, five and a half years. When I got to prison, you know, yeah, you could do bad or do good in prison. And uh, I decided I was going to do good. So when I got there, I ended up getting me a, a good job inside prison, uh, got me a 1A classification uh had probably one of the best jobs in the state as far as prisoners go I was working at the state police headquarters i got to come home on furloughs i took a lot of classes uh i don't know it was i mean it was bad but i, I learned from my mistake you know i uh, i came out with a lot better head on my shoulders so uh, as as bad as i hated that i got hooked on drugs i was able to to make make good use of my time and uh and get back out when i matter of fact before i actually got out i had a prescription or subscription to the Kenhunt magazine and uh bought me a belt light and i uh, bought me some vans waiters and i uh, had them shipped to the house and they were here my first day out of prison i went back to coon hunting and uh you know that's what i've been doing ever since that unfortunate part of my story um you 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 hit on some things there, and, and you know you're you're definitely opening yourself up to be very vulnerable here to talk about you know what happened in your life, and I, I appreciate you you doing that. But one one of the things that you touched on there was you, you you got in trouble. You didn't make any excuses for it was this or that or whatever. You just you got in trouble. Realize the 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 woes of, of what's going on. Got put yourself in a good situation. Sound like you worked hard to to stay away from trouble uh, when you were locked up. And, and somewhere along that way in in prison, you obviously made your mind up. Whenever you get out of there, you you're not going back that direction. It sounds like to me. Yeah, that's that's right. And um, you know, when I got back out, you know. Of course, I've been gone for, you know, half a decade, so things have changed. I surrounded myself with good people, uh, mainly coon hunters, to be honest with you, and uh, just went back to coon hunting. And that was my, that was, you know, I think when I started back coon hunting after that, Jason, I think, you know, and I had a passion for it before. I think it was even greater the second time ago around because it was like, it was like therapy. That was my new release, and uh, that's when I started hunting with uh, my buddy Preston, the one that actually started me hunting on my very first coon hunt. He had started hunting red bones, and uh, he had some good ones, and he wanted me to handle them in the hunts, and I did, and I had a lot of success there. And uh, 
to be honest with you, if I wasn't hunting English dogs, I think I'd be hunting red bones because I had a lot of fun hunting the, the red bones and I went to a lot of their uh, red bone days and just a good group of people. And uh, he had a dog named Fireballs Hacksaw Jack. And if I could pick three of my favorite dogs, Jack would be in the running. He'd be in the three. He was a get struck, get tree type dog, ball mouth, uh, chop on the tree, and he had his coons. And uh, Preston actually bought him, went and bought him from Joe Melton, the guy that started the fireball line. And uh, Joe told Preston when he bought him, he's something special, and he was. He would. I let him ride in the front seat of the truck with me when we'd stay at the refuge. He'd stay in the in the camper with me, and uh, he just wasn't a coon dog. That dog was my friend. <laughs> and uh, Preston's got some semen stored on him, and whenever he uses it, I'm gonna I'm gonna get me a pup, and I'm gonna I'm gonna have one. So. Yeah, and I, I, you know, I, I think it's pretty cool that the guy that got you started in the coon hunting years ago, when whenever you were, what most people would say at the low point of your life, was there to be to be a, a friend and and help you get a dog to to get you in the woods. And you know, I, I've heard story after story after story how coon hunting saved my life, coon hunting changed my life, coon hunting kept me out of trouble, and that, that don't sound any different than than here. And, and, and we talked before we hit recording uh, of some recovery stuff uh, that you do, some speaking at. Won't, won't you go ahead and let's talk about that, and then we'll go back and, and finish with these hounds. Okay, absolutely. Uh, like I said earlier, I like to talk God in recovery just as I like to talk dogs. So uh, about six years ago, I got involved with a program called Celebrate Recovery. It's a Christ-centered 12-step recovery program. Uh, it's ran through, uh, you know, your local churches. And, um, you know, I went reluctantly because at that point, my relationship with Christ wasn't just real strong. You know, I felt guilt. I felt shame. You know, how could I be loved? But I was met at the door with open arms, uh, love and acceptance from the uh, the ministry leaders, the people going. And, uh I that after that first meeting I was blown away. I was ready for the next week to roll around so I could go back. But uh celebrate recovery uh is for people with life's hurts, habits and hang ups. It's not just about addiction, it's about everything. Uh because we know that our higher power Jesus Christ could heal us and deliver us from anything that we got going on. And I uh I fell in love with the program, the people. So I've been going, you know, for uh, six years now. Uh, I'm a Small group leader at the one I currently go to. I have been a ministry leader at a different one. And uh, it just, it's for everybody and all things. And uh, through that program, I thought I was working on, you know, just the the shame and guilt of, you know, my addiction. I realized I had a lot of other things that were wrong with me and uh, <clears throat> turn them over to God's, you know, uh, recovery. And man, I've been every time I go, I feel blessed. And that's why I continue to go. Uh, I'm, you know, I've a, I'm a sponsor of over half a dozen men. I look forward to talking to them at the group every week. When they call, I like talking to them. Um, You know, whenever I look at my phone, it's one of my uh, sponsors calling me, you know, I'm excited because they call me with their, uh, you know, their, not just their downside, but their praise reports. And it's really awesome to see what God can do through somebody that's willing to turn it over to God. Uh, program's been a blessing. I know that there's 34,000 Celebrate Recoveries worldwide. We're in over 12 countries. And if you go on the Internet, you could uh, find a CR locator. And, uh, you know, if you know somebody that needs a recovery man, go with them. Take them. You know, uh, they serve a meal at most of them. And then they have a large group format where we'll do uh, worship you know, a testimony or a lesson. And then we break into small open share groups where it's just men with men, women with women. And that's really where the real healing begins. When you could hear somebody's testimony or hear about what they're going through and they're like, Hey, I've went through that. You could, you know, you could grow, you know, accountability that way. And, um, that's, that's, it's been a saving grace for me, Jason. I, you know, I get therapy in the woods, but I get recovery at church and it's, it's been a blessing to me. I could highly, highly suggest it to anybody that's going through a life hurt or hang up to go to a cell back recovery you will definitely not be disappointed yeah and you know you you mentioned there that your your dad died when you were younger and, and you had a mentor step in but one, one of the things you mentioned about this recovery program is the men with men and women with women 
I know for me, um, and, and I've not been through some of the stuff you've been through, but I know for me how important it is for my brothers in Christ to be around uh, me and, and what an encouragement it is when we sh- share, uh, you know, with each other, um, you know, about what's going on in our lives. Uh, and it's just me and sitting around. We have a men's breakfast at our church. And, and I know for, for me that that is one of the most important things for me to be a part of because, you know, we, we can just come together as men of God and, and help each other out and, 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 and just help lift each other up. And I'm sure that's probably some of the same stuff that goes on with y'all. Absolutely. Well, it's biblical, Jason, you know, uh, iron sharpens iron, just like one man sharpens another. And it's, that's, it's absolutely the truth. That's exactly what happens. And it's just, you know, it's been a good, a good thing for me. And like I was saying, you know, my relationship with Christ is kind of rocky when I started. It's never been stronger. And I, you know, I got my faith back seeing the miracles through God at Celebrate Recovery. And it's just, um, it's been amazing. Well, if nobody gets anything else out of this podcast, I, I hope they listen to your story and, and see where you were at and, and at that lowest point of your life, uh, see, seeing where you were at and seeing where you're at today. Um, like I said, when we started this, your, your picture of you and your dogs are on the cover of a magazine that um, I know as growing up, it was a magazine I looked forward to getting um, whenever they come out. Uh, to, to look through the, the different coon hunting stuff that was there. I've ordered stuff from, from Nightlight. So um, fr- from going to that to, to where you are today, I, I, I'd say you de- you definitely uh, definitely on the right path and, and uh, headed in the right direction. Well, well, thank you. Thank you so much. So you, uh, you, you also, besides getting your picture on the front of the magazine, um, you also won um, the NKC World hunt so let, let's tell us tell us what dog you're hunting uh in, in this hunt and let's kind of talk about about that cast okay well to talk about that hunt i gotta back up just a little bit because i owned the dog that i won with um, sire and dan so in 2011 my buddy was hunting in a cast and he got beat and he said man i got beat by a pretty nice young dog and it just happened to be an English dog. And at this time, you know, I was just handling for Preston. I didn't have my own dog. So I was like, what dog? And he showed me the dog. And I was like, man, that's a beautiful dog. His name was uh, Jesse, outlaw Jesse James. <laughs> and he was um, a grandson to Swamp Brewster. Well, I I had to have him. So I worked out a deal. I ended up buying him. I actually had to go get a loan and, uh, you know, pay pretty good money for him. I bought him. And he, he was he was a decent young dog. He was not there yet, but he, you know, he had a lot of potential and I hunted him hard and I ended up uh, night champion him and grand show champion him. And, uh, he had a lot of the traits that I liked. So he was a cold nosed dog, a tree layup. So if a coon wasn't moving, he was still going to show you coons. And that's what I liked about him. Cause down here in Arkansas, sometimes when coons don't move when it's real cold, you need a dog to tree layups and he would do it in a, Matter of fact, one year we was at the refuge and we seen some people come out and say, we trained three coons and we've been hunting five hours. And I went in there behind them and trained 11 coons with this dog and not a single one of them coons had been on the ground. So I wanted that, you know, that trait, you know, in my future dog. So I ended up buying a, a female at a, a Outback Dan and a, and a dog named Baker's White Trash. Her name was Snow. And uh, I ended up bringing her... I had a litter before her. I had a, a, a grand night dog named uh, Brooks. Uh, I can't remember his whole name. His name was his name was Jabber. He was out of a off a, off Water Creek Roscoe, and uh, them puppies at seven months old were trained coons. So I bred her, bred the the snow that I bred to Jabber, bred her to Jesse, and she had eleven pups, and there's the prettiest pups I've ever seen, and uh. About this time, I I had got married and I went through a bad divorce, and uh, about the only asset I had at the time was 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 Jesse. I didn't sell Jabber, uh, sold him for a lot of money, uh, but I had Jesse, and uh, sold Jesse to a guy in Louisiana for two thousand dollars. And this is another God thing, Jason. So I sold Jesse, and when I sold 
Jesse, the guy's dad drove up from Louisiana to buy him. I met him at a Walmart parking lot. And I was crying so bad when I sold this dog, I couldn't even sign the papers. And he said, son, I'll go back to Louisiana without your dog. He said, I could tell you I don't want to sell this dog. And I, I told him, I said, sir, I, it's not that I want to sell my dog. I need that money, you know, because I have bills to pay and whatever. <laughs> so I sell Jesse and message the guy about it every other week about Jesse, how he's doing. And my phone rings 2 o'clock in the morning. And I saw it was that guy's number. And I thought he either got hit by a car or got ate by an alligator. You don't want to answer it. And I answer it. And he goes, hey, Jared. You know, he goes, uh, you ain't going to believe this, but uh, I was walking in the tree tonight, and God told me that you need this dog back. I said, what? He goes, well, that's not the crazy part. He said, I told my dad, and my dad said I was crazy. And the second tree we made, he said, you're going to give this guy's dog back. I said, and the guy's name was Scott. I said, Scott, I can't buy him back. You know, I sold that money before your dad, you know, got back to Louisiana. And uh, he said, uh, you know, I'm not trying to sell you your dog back. I'm trying to give you your dog back. Come get your dog. Dude, I lost it. So we loaded up, and uh, a couple of days later, I went down there. And to, I don't remember where in Louisiana he was, but it took us seven hours to get there. So he's pretty far down in there. That's how I got Jesse back. And I'm glad I did because the second cross I made on snow with Jesse is where copper came from. And um, there's a, there's three or four Grand Night dogs out of the, the snow crosses, the two crosses. Uh, can't buy any. I'm trying to buy another one right now. Um, people won't put prices on them because they like them. But, so I had copper uh, was born. Uh, I gave her to a guy in Fort Ice named Jay Lash. And uh, I don't know if everybody does this, but whenever I have a good litter of puppies that I think will make something, I'll give them to coon hunters. If I know they're going to get coon hunted, I'll give them puppies and in hopes that they'll make them, you know, into a dog. So that's what I did with Jay. He's a real coon hunter, so I gave him copper. And about a year, about a year and a half later, well, she started at nine months, seven or nine months old. He started sending me videos of her. And uh, I'm like, man, she's pretty nice. And I finally got a hunt with her when she was about a year and a half old. And uh, she looked good. Big, big, you know, ball mouth on track, hard tree dog. <laughs> she was still young, you know, she was still, you know, working through young stuff. But I was like, well, sell me that dog. He's like, no, she ain't for sale. So uh, at the time, I kind of wasn't doing a lot of coon hunting. I ended up getting into showing and raising ABC American Bullies. So coon hunting wasn't on the forefront of my mind, you know, showing these bullies was. But I'd always wanted to have a you know, good dog out of my dogs. So I kind of kept up with, with, uh, with Copper and rocked on there i got a i got a son off jesse that i really liked and i was hunting him and uh you know you know people they, they go through dogs i was going through dogs some good some not but i went hunting with jay i guess it would have been 2000 around a little after christmas it was cold and copper put on a clinic and i decided right then i wanted to buy this dog and he was adamant he wasn't going to sell her and i don't want to say that i harassed this guy but I, I probably harassed him about selling me this dog. And finally, I sent him a message and said, hey, I don't know if you woke up thinking about this, but I woke up thinking today was the day you're going to sell me your dog. And he sent me back a message, and I'll think about it. And that was the first time he ever kind of acted like he might would sell her. So he finally called me later that day, and we worked out a deal. We co-owned her. Uh, I bought half of her, and I got her and went to hunting her. And, you know, she's nice. She... She likes the tree coon. She's a lot like her daddy with her mama's tree power. She could tree layups, you know, hot coons, cold coons. She um, accurate and uh, I put a uh, put a couple of UKC wins on her early in the year, and then the NKC World Hunt was coming up, and they normally have it, I think, in Indiana or Illinois, but for some reason they were going to have it in Arkansas that year, so I was going to go uh, in a I thought she was ready, then I took her, and the thing about the NKC World Hunt is, is you can hunt hounds or curs in it, and uh, I never hunted with a cur dog. I've done all this coon hunting over all these years. I've never been in the woods with a cur dog, and let me tell you something. They're coon little training machines. They don't bark a bunch on the ground, but when they bark, they're about to tree, so when you hear a cur dog bark on you, you're about to go look at a tree, and uh so we get there and it's in February. It's at a wildlife management area that gets hunted over pretty good. So um, 
you know, your dogs really got to hustle to find a coon. <clears throat> but uh, the first night I was there, there's quite a few dogs there, you know, and first night is a two night hunt. I drew out with a, it was me with copper and um, two, I guess they're original mountain curs. Uh, that is black and brindle. But, uh, man, we had a good hunt. We trained, I think we ended up training three coons. Uh, I didn't win my cast. I lost by a quarter, I believe. And, uh, but, uh, it's like, these little cur dogs are nice. And that was a two-hour hunt, two-hour cast. Well, I decided to go back the next night because they was going to hunt. The finals was going to be a, uh, the top four dogs of the Friday night hunt and then the Saturday night hunt. Well, there wasn't very many dogs that that had a very high score Friday night because it was so cold and uh, coons weren't moving real good. So I decided to go back. I might could get in, you know, and uh, uh, went back Saturday and I ended up drawing uh, a dog that I'd hunted with before. As a matter of fact, my cast was my first round cast was a, a cur dog named Rig. Uh, and then the dog that won the state championship, PKC state championship in Arkansas, uh, named Crockett, super coon dog. Uh, his owner, Blackdale, super good guy. So I knew I had a pretty tough cast. Just hope the coons were moving. So we turn loose, and uh, Copper gets first strike, and she kind of boohooing around in there. And she normally don't stay in one place for very long, but this night she kind of wallowed her track out for about 20 minutes, and I was getting kind of mad because I figured – Crockett was going to slam a coon on me somewhere, and, you know, you know, it's kind of hard to catch up once you get behind, especially with dogs that don't make a lot of mistakes. And uh, uh, the rig dog went in there and treed finally, and on the way to him, she come by, and I took Minus on the track. The rig dog was slick. Uh, we turned loose again, and uh, Copper fired off in there. She got 700 yards and opened up, and – I've hunted with Copper enough to know what kind of track she's running. She's running a pretty hot track. I figured we was going to see that cone. And she comes slam treed, and <clears throat> I think there's 13 minutes left in the hunt. So we head over there to her, and Blake Dell says, Hey, I got the cone. I had the cone. So that put me on the plus side. And uh, there's, I think, three minutes left in the hunt. And uh, that rig dog treed again. And even if he had had a cone, he couldn't have beat me because he had took minus on his first tree. And, uh, so I won my first round, and uh, I was like, well, let's go back and see what what kind of score, you know, get, if it will place me. And we get back and get to looking, and it put me in the top four, that one cast from that one night. And uh, so I would, at this point, Jason, I'll be honest with you, I was just happy to be in the final cast of a world hunt. Uh, you know, I thought I had a good chance of winning, but if I didn't, I was still happy. And uh, so we went out, and it was about, I don't know, quarter to one when we got to the woods and frosty, cold, still. We turn loose. It's me, a dog named Slim, who had won the cast the night before, and he's a nice dog. He treated two coons that first night. And uh, his owner, D. Powell, is one of the nicest guys you'll hunt with. And uh, I really enjoyed hunting with him and look forward to hunting with him again soon. But uh, we turn loose, and Copper strikes first. Uh, she works a bad track, kind of right handed, and then goes left handed. And it's not a very good track. And uh, she comes trading. I treat her, and I think she's about 500. And we go to her, and I'm walking up. <clears throat> and we have to walk up this little hill. And just walking up, I glance the tree, and it's, there ain't a leaf on this tree. So it's either going to be yay or day. And we get there, and I'm, I shine this tree, and there ain't a coon in this tree. And uh, Blake said, well, here's a hole. And there's a hole about the size of a pumpkin, about 10 feet up. And it goes all the way up, and then the hole curves over to the up into a branch you can't see up into that branch so i got lucky and took circle there uh two uh first of uh, in nkc is first strikes 100 first trees 100 so i had 200 circle there blake strikes his dog in there deep and he works out of hearing uh before we actually walk to my dog so we call time out with about i think there might might have been 20 minutes left to hunt the final cast was one hour and uh so I'm saying that 200 and both the other guys have zero, 200 circle I got. We go in there and we drive around to a different spot and turn loose and Copper goes in there and strikes. 
in a she works this track I don't know maybe I don't know maybe 12 or 13 minutes and I tree her you gotta wait five in NKC for the tree to be closed so we're walking to her when we start walking to her there's only one and a half minutes left in the hunt the other two dogs still ain't barked uh, and there was a non-hunting judge he goes time hunts over and we walk in there to copper and uh, when she's really really fired up if you tie her up with a leash she'll chew through the leash so I had to find a tree where I could hang the leash up into the tree where she couldn't get to the to the cloth part and as soon as I did that I turned around and looked and Coon was sitting in the first fork and I had just won the NKC world hunt with a dog that I you know had uh, owned both her parents and was bred at my house and that was to me was the was was kind of the highlight because you know I see a lot of her parents in her and you know her parents Jesse was one of the three dogs I said I've had died at my house Jesse died at my house and he's buried here and I see a lot of her a lot of him in her and that's how I won the NKC world hunting uh it was a uh, it was an awesome truck ride back knowing what I just accomplished with you know with a hound that I you know had bred and you know won won some cool prizes and up to that point that was that's probably the biggest you know achievement in competition hunting that I've had so that's how I won the NKC World Hunt yeah and you know to to win any World Hunt whether it's NKC UKC PKC I, I mean what what an accomplishment to to do I, I mean there's a lot of people strive to 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 win certain hunts and you know I, I i'm still just trying to get to to a to a final cast in, in, a, in a world hunt and, and get through zones or or whatever so hey congratulations on, on the win uh that's a that's a big accomplishment in in, in any uh registry uh that we have that we hunt in um, well it, i appreciate that so how did the picture come about on the magazine? We've mentioned it a few times. How, how, well, t- tell us a little bit of the relationship you have with uh, Nightlight. Are you tired of whipping, scolding, and shocking to make them get alone? Is your buddy tired of helping you set your dog up for correction night after night? Do you really want your dog to be alone because you forced him to be? Or would you rather him be alone because he wants to be? Grand Knight Champion Small Town Lone Survivor is the product of over 25 years of strong natural-born independent traits. This bold trait has been passed down from generation to generation and is showing up in Loner offspring today. Loner is a direct son of Hall of Fame Grand Knight Champion Cabin Creek Rowdy and Grand Knight Champion Lonesome Dove Lori. Loner has a booming mouth that is talked about in every cast he has been in including the 2021 World Hunt Finals. Loner is a no-reverse, ball-mouth-open trailer who ends it plussed up with a huge dying locate and steady chop. Loner loves getting split and is a stay-put gun-pressure tree dog. Loner's intelligence is also impressive. He knows over 12 voice and hand signal commands. Loner has a character that loves like Jesus, but he doesn't walk on water. If you're interested in breeding to Loner, contact Brett Stevens at Small Town English Kennels at 417-300-3777 or find him on Facebook. If you're interested in running a stud ad for your dog here on the Coonhound Collective podcast, reach out to us at thecoonhoundcollective at gmail.com. Send us a message through Facebook or Instagram, and we'll be glad to get with you to get your ad bill and get you pricing on all of our ads. Okay. Uh, it really was just a social media thing. I've seen them post uh, uh, huntsmart.com, you know, Facebook page posted you know send us your pictures if you want your dog posted so i sent him a couple of pictures i like to take videos and pictures of my dogs when i'm coon hunting so uh i sent him a couple of pictures and they reached out to me and they're like uh says here that you're in sheridan or something to that effect i'm like yeah and they're like okay <laughs> you know nightlight is an arkansas based company uh they're based out of clarksville their main office is in little rock so he said, can I contact you? And I said, sure. So they called and we got to talking and, uh, they, uh, 
wanted me to try out some of their gear so they got me some gear and i you know i hunted with their gear and checked it out and liked it and they wanted to know if i could get anybody together for a photo shoot and uh so yeah i could get you know i know a lot of people in a lot of places i said absolutely so uh let's see we did the photo shoot it was just started to get hot but anyway all this time goes by from when we decide we're going to do the photo shoot to finally doing the photo shoot and my contact had always told me that he wanted a picture of a hunter with two dogs on one leash and i was like that is no problem you know i mean i, I could make that happen for you and that's what we did and we went and did the photo shoot down here at the state park and about three days later, I messaged him. I said, hey, did you get the shot? He goes, oh, yeah, you're going to be happy. And he sent me kind of a rough edited version of it. I was like, that's a good picture. And he goes, you're going to be in the, on the cover of our Christmas Christmas special in a catalog. I was like, excellent. So that's how I got on the cover of Nightlight. And I guess I've been been dealing with them, you know, uh, their brand ambassador for about a year now. And they've been really good to me. They're a good company. They came and took pictures and sponsored uh, the state Arkansas state youth hunt this year. Got a lot of pictures of the kids and the dogs and they uh, just have been an awesome company and, and really believe in the sport and, you know, hounds and wildlife. Yeah. Well, and I wanted you to kind of mention that, mention them because they, they are a product that has been around for, for quite some time now. And I, I know that you had done some stuff with them. So uh, I definitely wanted to give them uh, a little shout out here. Yes, sir. I, yeah, they've uh, they've been they've been really good to me, and you know I kind of asked for better people to work alongside. Yeah, that's that's awesome. Well, Jared, I know it's hard to believe, but we've been at it almost an hour. By the time I, I, we get our my intro put in here, it will be over an hour. Um, I don't. Well, my wife does tell me I like to talk. <laughs> well, my <laughs> mine does too. She knows when it when it comes to talking hounds, it, it can be a long winded conversation uh, for sure. Um, we we covered a lot of ground here in, in a short period of time. If, if there's nothing that you think we missed or need to add, I think we're to a point we can shut it down. Unless you think there's something that we missed and we need to add in there. Well. Uh... Normally, you ask if there's a coon hunting story you want to tell, and I done thought of one or two All that, right. I, that, I, that, that, I think, that I think is they're kind of funny. That might get it, you know, might get somebody to crack up. Well, l- lay it on us. We we, that, we, we right. always love a good coon hunting story around here <laughs> for sure. Well, they weren't too good for me, so I got I got two of them. Uh, a couple years ago, me and my wife, she don't hunt with me much now, but we went to the refuge, and it was the first time I'd ever had an alpha in my hand she wanted to hold the garmin <laughs> and uh i was like okay that's fine so we're out there and we're gonna trade two or three coons and jesse he you know my foundation male he was he is naturally straight so he don't run no off game but i hear him out there squealing and he's coming right to me i was like turn your light off turn your light off that dog's running a deer i think he's about to catch it and he comes and jumps in my lap i'm sitting on a log i said uh-oh what were you doing? She goes, I'm pushing this button right, and she hit it and it lit him up. I was like, man, you didn't ruin my dog. And uh, poor Jesse, he went to hunt for the next two or three drops, and I finally had to load him up. And I took the garment away from my wife, loaded him up, and turned him loose down the road. And he got her back. He went 0.97 miles to knee deep water and treat a slick persimmon tree. And uh, she had to walk to him. So he kind of got her back. That was one story that kind of, you know, felt bad for my dog, but it's kind of funny to look back on. Well, and, uh, before you tell your second one, I got to tell a tell a story on myself here. When I was in high school, I got a Tritronics um, trash breaker shock system. First time I've ever had one in my hands, and um, it, it wasn't even mine. I was I was uh, just borrowing it from a guy to try to break a dog off a deer, and I had the collar on the dog, and you know I I didn't think anything about it that controllers round i just stuck it in my back pocket and um you know my my dogs don't bark in the box and i got in the truck and started down the road and i guess i adjusted just right and all of a sudden this dog sounds like he's about to tear the dog box apart and i get out of the truck and he stops i get back in the truck and he starts back i stop and get out of the truck and he stops again well I couldn't find out every time i jumped in the truck i was sitting on that on the button and i learned real quick not to put that controller in my back pocket Oh my gosh! I did the same thing with my with my alpha. I got a hunting pouch, and if I leaned against my truck, 
it will hit the shock button. So whenever I'm hunting, it's actually turned down all the way on one now, so I don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, my, my second story, uh, never been scared of coon hunting, but this, this night I got scared not from what was in the woods because I thought I was going to die. Me and my buddy, it was, I guess, summer 21 is in July. We got a wildlife management area over here in Arkansas called Biomeda, and we decided to go over there and hunt. Was around July 6th or 7th because – my wife has we have a lake house and she goes to the lake house. I don't like the lake, so I just said I was gonna go hunting over there when she was gone. So it's somewhere around minute, you know, beginning of July, and I'm hunting copper. I got a young dog I had named Karma, and uh, my buddy David was hunting his little Walker dog Briar, and uh, Karma and Briar were both young, and every now and again they'd run something they weren't supposed to. So I put the shot collar on my shot collar on Briar. And just put my T5 on copper. Who's she's tone trained, but you know I didn't have the tone thing on her. But anyways, turn loose and copper goes goes in there and she trees. Copper and karma goes in there almost a mile on trees. And I don't know why I only had one bottle of water, but I had one bottle of water and I drank it all before we could get to halfway to karma. She quits and I'm hot and I'm. You know that hot where you got a deep breath type hot and it's still ain't enough? I'm that kind of hot. And uh, we get to, to Copper's tree and she has a coon tree. And my buddy says, uh, Bud, he goes, it's too hot to be doing this. I don't feel too good. I'm like, I don't feel too good either. Let's leave. So we, we walk out to a power line. And I know it's impossible for it to be uphill, you know, all the way. But I swear this power line was uphill the whole way. It's muddy and that real bog down mud. And my heart's going kaboom, kaboom, kaboom. And all I could tell my buddy Dave was, but I ain't doing so good. I finally laid down uh, in the power line, and I told David, I said, uh, I said, keep an eye on Copper. Uh, I didn't have her on a leash. I said, and so she was sitting there, and I was laying down. And I was laying there thinking, if there's any way I could get rescued, I sure wish it would be right now because I was I was hot. And uh, I was having the wall balls. And uh, there for a little bit, I thought I might die. But anyways, so we're laying there, and I hear this dog opens up in there. He goes, hey, bud, somebody's in here. Maybe they could give us some water. I was like, no, dude, that's copper. So he said, I can't go get her. So I went in there 600 yards and got her and ended up having to walk out that same power line that about killed me the first go around. <clears throat> and when we got back to the truck, we just put our stuff back in the truck. And we, it was probably 15 minutes before either one of us spoke. And then I said, not again, bud. I'm not hunting over here again in the summertime. <laughs> Yeah, so well, anyways, my wife, my wife made me a shirt. It's kind of funny. I'm laid out. I'm laying down and it's got the, the caption. Of, I ain't doing so good on it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I've, you know, hunt, hunting here where I hunt in Missouri up and down these hills. They, 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 there's been a few of them that I thought, man, I don't know if I'm gonna make it to the top of this joker to the, to get to the dogs, uh, especially in the summertime, for sure. It, it, you can get too hot too quick. Uh, for sure, especially in deep mud or a real hilly, hilly terrain. Yeah, it, it can happen in a hurry. And one more thing, Jason, I didn't mention, but I would like to say, um, take a kid hunting. We've got a lot of kids around here to go hunting, and we like to get them in the woods. And don't look at them as an inconvenience. Look at them as a future. Load them up, take them hunting, you know, put a good dog at the end of the lead, you know, put some, uh, you know, I got six or seven coon lights. I always put, you know, you know, give them a good coon light to take, and it changes these kids' these kids' lives. And I know I got my start like that, you know, being mentored, you know, by Clifton. And just uh, anybody in your area, if you hear about a kid wanting to go hunting, go get them and take them hunting. It's a feature of our sport, and we definitely need them in there. So that's another thing I'd like to mention. Well. I don't think I could have could have ended it any better way than that because that is the future of our sport. And if you have an opportunity to take a young person hunting, definitely, definitely jump on that and take them hunting. Um, we've been at it a little over an hour. Uh, if if you don't have anything else, I think I think that's a good spot to 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 land it here. And maybe we can uh, get together at English Days uh, or, or at some hunt down the road here in the, here in the near future, and I can meet you in person and shake your hand. I sure would like that, Jason. I'll be at English Days. Wednesday through Sunday this year, so find me and let's get in the woods sometime. All right, buddy, that sounds good, and we'll we'll end it here. Thank y'all for listening to the Coonhound Collective podcast today.
Thanks, guys, for listening to the Coonhound Collective podcast today. We really appreciate you taking your time out of your day to listen to the podcast. If you don't mind, head over to Facebook and give us a like, and head over to Instagram and give us a follow. It's both at The Coonhound Collective. Also, if you would like to reach us here at The Coonhound Collective, you can reach us at thecoonhoundcollective at gmail.com. If there's someone that you would like to hear on the podcast or a product that you would like to hear talked about, please send it to thecoonhoundcollective at gmail.com. Thanks again. Have a great day.